Hello, welcome to the SDG Lead, a series of conversations with prominent SDG changemakers worldwide. Today, I have deep honor to talk with uh, Dr. Jackson Ketz, educator, filmmaker, author and TEDx speaker, a founder of uh, Mentors in Violence Prevention Program, uh, which is actively used by the United States military and various sporting organizations. Today, we will in particular focus on the SDG number five, which is gender equality in its very crucial and important aspects, uh, such as uh, the men's role in stopping violence against women. Uh, Dr. Katz, thank you so much for joining. It's a deep, deep honor. Oh, it, I'm very happy to be here with you, uh, Karina. Thank you for inviting me to be part of your initiative. Thank you. It's just a deep privilege. Uh, just to uh, give for our viewers a kind of uh, understanding of enormous and amazing work that you do, uh, could you please uh, tell us how your path uh, uh, has started uh, and uh, what are the key uh, scope uh, of your current activities and programs? Sure, well, I've, I've been doing the, the kind of work that I am currently doing for a long time. I started when I was a young man in the you know, university when I was 19 years old. And I, I realized through a series of events and both inside and outside the classroom, just how big a problem um, gender inequality and specifically men's violence against women was. And I started speaking out as a young man, writing you know, as a young journalist, a young student journalist, writing, um, you know, opinion articles about uh, trying to imagine what I would feel like if I were a woman and I had to live with in incredible levels of uh, potential violence and sexual harassment and other forms of abuse from, um, you know, from men. Um, I remember thinking and as a young guy about women who spoke up and who were organizing, young you know, feminists and others who were organizing for um, better lighting on campus and, you know, sexual assault prevention and things like that. I remember thinking not that they hated men or that they had some kind of agenda against men, but rather that they were leaders. They were standing up for themselves. They were standing up for other women and, and men, everybody who has the right to be free from, you know, harassment, abuse, and violence. And I remember thinking one time I went to a, a rally when I was in university and it was organized by women, students, um, after a rape had happened on my campus. And um, I remember thinking, again, not that those women were like anti-male, but that they were leaders. And I remember thinking, why aren't there men out there? Why was it all women protesting when men are the ones who are committing the vast majority of the rape and the sexual assault and the, and the domestic violence? It's like, and most men don't commit rape and most men don't commit domestic violence, but why aren't there men out there speaking out? And why aren't there men, more men who are leaders in the public you know, uh, arena uh, speaking strongly about, you know, against domestic and sexual violence? And I remember thinking, if they're not out there and they should be, well, I'm gonna start doing it. I mean, it just made sense to me. And, and when I started speaking out and writing about this, I, I started hearing from women around me, like friends, and girlfriends and other women in my life and in my extended you know social circles and i realized oh my god this is so much more common than i thought and the fear the daily fear not just the experience of abuse and violence but the fear of violence the way that it orders women's daily lives i remember thinking if i were a woman and i had to live like that i had to constantly worry about being sexually assaulted by men and constantly vigilant about my personal safety because the other members of the other gender were gonna potentially assault me just because I happen to be a woman. I remember how thinking how ticked off I would be. And, and, it, and, and it inspired me in a, in a certain sense to start speaking out. And like I said, there were very few men, this is back in the, I have to say, this is back in the early 1980s. <laughs> so very few men were speaking out about this, but now there, now there are more men doing it. But back in those early days, you know, my inspiration was mostly from women and my support, the people who were supportive of what I was doing were mostly women, not only women, there were, there were men, but my, my lifelong goal has been, how do we get more men engaged in this conversation? 
and how do we get enough men to join the women who are at the forefront and who are the real leaders in this work, you know, in, in, in all over the world, in a multiracial, multi-ethnic sense, how do we get more men to join them? Because if we get more men to join those women who are already doing the great work, um, then we would have the tipping point for the transformative change that has to happen. But honestly, it's a lifelong process and we, we still have a long, long way to go. And one last thing, I'm doing today what I started doing as a 19 year old. I write, I write, I write books, I write articles, I write, um, uh, excuse me, I give lectures all over the world, although in COVID it's been mostly Zoom. Um, I do trainings. My, my org the organization that I run is racially diverse and mixed gender. We do trainings in schools, in, in universities, in sports culture, in all the you know, branches of the United States military. And we work a number of, we've been working in a number of countries in Europe and in Australia. Um, but the whole goal is, or one of the major goals is to prevent sexual harassment and sexual assault and domestic violence through a series of approaches that involve how everybody in a given peer culture can play a constructive role and how men in particular need to stand up and speak out and start challenging other men and interrupting abusive behavior and men in positions of leadership need to need to make these issues a priority and not just to push them aside and all of that is you know consumes a lot of my time and and, and my work you mentioned very important aspects. Uh, the first one is empathy. So we shall not treat uh, uh, the gender-based violence as gender issues. Uh, uh, men's or women's is about humanity. Uh, when you try to uh, fit uh, in other shoes, uh, as I've understood, uh, so trying to fill in all these uh, uh, connections uh, and all these uh, processes from the other side. And another aspect is disseminating information. Uh, so do you feel that uh, we have uh, a significant change? Uh, I think it's, uh, uh, yes, so, uh, speaking about 90s uh, and current times when we have uh, he for she campaigns uh, and we are talking about this uh, more and more. And I think uh, this is because uh, of such men, uh, not the least, as you speaking out uh, and uh, increasing this uh, awareness. Sure. I mean, yes, there has been an increase in the number of who, would, who, who make these issues a priority and who use whatever platform of influence they have. Um, not, a, not all men have a big you know, platform. Not all men are leaders. Not all men are political leaders or religious or business leaders or, you know, I understand that. But all men have a role to play, right? And all men have a sphere of influence, whether it's in their families, in their communities, in their workplaces. But Karina, it's nowhere near enough men who have had the courage and the strength to, to, to stand up and talk about this stuff honestly and openly and partner with women and ally with women. There have been men, and again, I don't mean to say there haven't been, but just nowhere near enough. And, and still to this day in you know, 2021, a lot of men will say, well, these are important issues, but they're not my issues. Or they're, they're important, but for the women to take care of. And, you, you know, I think it's important to, to have the women address these issues. Meanwhile, who's committing most of the violence? It's men. Who, and who, ha who has most of the power, the social, the political, the economic power in the world? It's men. And so if men are going to then say that this is not our responsibility, we're going to give, you know, we're going to put it on, on to the women. In that, in that sense, that's a form of victim blaming. That's like blaming the victim. It's like, wait a second. The problem isn't women. The problem is that men are doing this. And again, I don't think it's something that's inherent in being a man. I don't think it's something that we're born with or it's biologically predetermined. I think that's ridiculous. The question is, what can men do who have influence, both, both in our peer cultures, but also with young men? In other words, men who are fathers, men who are teachers, men who are coaches, men who have influence in the lives of young men. What are we doing, those of us, to impart to the next generation, like your generation, um, the, the ideas about manhood that don't rely on, you know, dominance and, and exerting your will through physical force or intimidation or, or the sexual entitlement to women's bodies that so many men feel. How do we impart to the, young, the next generation values that are more democratic, that, that are, are, are based in justice and fairness and equality, 
to me, that's what a, a true strong man does in the 21st century. And yet we still, we still have to push men because I think a lot of men are very uncomfortable with this subject. I think a lot of men get defensive and they, you know, they, they, they don't want to think about their own responsibility. Can I also say, there's a real big difference between guilt and responsibility, right? So, so sometimes people will say, when they hear men like myself talk, they'll say, well, he feels guilty about being a man and I don't feel guilty. I feel proud of being a man or something silly like that. Okay. I don't feel guilty for being a man. That's ridiculous. That's how I, I was born a man. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not defending. I mean, excuse me. I'm not going to make any apologies. I don't feel guilty, but I feel responsible. I feel responsible as a man with certain advantages. And I look around myself, like I look around me and I see incredible gender inequality all over the world. I see incredible violence and abuse and harassment that so many men engage in against women, against other men as well. And I think, what can I do as a man to do something about this, to use whatever platform of influence that I have, whatever skills that I have, whatever advantages I, I happen to have, what can I do to contribute to the, you know, to, to the increase in equality and the decrease in violence perpetrated by so many men? And, and, and to me, that's, that's a critical distinction between guilt and responsibility. And I think it's important to say this because there are so many barriers to men getting involved. And by the way, I also wanna say, I don't think you have to be perfect as a man. I don't consider myself perfect. I don't consider myself fully evolved. I mean, I think it's a, a, it's a project, a lifelong project to try to be a better human being, right? And I think we, hopefully we're all engaged in that. But I would, I would say, because I think some men will say, I, about themselves, they'll say, I'm not in a position to tell other men how to behave because I get some problems myself, or I have some beliefs myself that are, you know, that, that might be sexist or that, that, that you know, that, that I might not be particularly proud of. So how can I tell other men to act a certain way if, if I have my own issues? And my, my response to that is, we don't have to expect perfection from men as a condition of them speaking out on these issues, because if we're waiting for men to be perfect and perfectly non-sexist, we're going to be waiting forever because there's no such man. And, and by the way, it's very similar to racism. Like, so in my country, as you know, the, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement and the movements for racial justice have gained worldwide attention. The, the argument of the Black Lives Matter movement and racial justice movements in the United States dating back to the civil rights movement, the argument to white people wasn't that white people had to be perfect or perfectly free of any racist thoughts or behaviors ever before they could speak out and support civil rights and racial justice. It was you had to be committed as a white person to working toward a society where, you know, racial justice was, you know, prominent and, and, and along the way, you're going to make mistakes. Along the way, you're going to say things and do things that might not be you know, perfectly thought through or perfectly defensible. But the, if you're committed to doing the work, you're going to be committed to you know, personal growth and hearing feedback and hearing commentary from, you know, from people of color. Or if you're a man, hearing from women, wait a second, maybe, maybe you're doing something wrong. Maybe what you just said is not OK. But okay, I'll learn from that. Thank you, for, thank you for the feedback. I'll learn from that. And I'll try to incorporate this in my, in my thinking going forward. But a lot of men, they don't even want to get the minimal amount of feedback. So they're like, I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to keep quiet. I'm, you know, I'm just going to keep you know, to myself. And, and, and if I don't abuse my wife or girlfriend and I don't treat women with disrespect, it's not really my issue. I'm just going to keep my head down. And that's the attitude that we have to counteract. And taking this responsibility is meaningful on all the levels, as we can clearly understand that even smaller step matters when a man uh, says something to his neighbor and to within his community. You've introduced very powerful approach, uh, which is called the bystander approach. Uh, could you please uh, elaborate uh, a bit more on that? Uh, and how does it shift uh, from the bipolar thinking uh, when we just in terms of uh, gender stereotypes, uh, it's women's issues, it's men's issues. So we are uh, somehow dividing this world uh, into stigmas and neither stigma uh, fully represents uh, the whole, the diversity of this world. 
absolutely. Um, well, yes, the bystander approach, which, which I'm one of the original architects of in the field of sexual assault and domestic violence prevention, the basic concept is everybody in a given peer culture, whether it's a small group of friends or in a big in organization or in a whole community or a whole country, you know, but the, but the, the idea is that instead of just focusing on the, the person doing the abusive behavior and the person experiencing it, the perpetrator and the victim, you focus on everybody around the perpetrator, everybody around the victim or the survivor. Um, and the goal is to get people around the, pe the person committing the abusive act to make it clear to that person that what he or she is doing is not okay, not just because they're gonna get in trouble with the authority figures, like the police or the, you know, the government or, or in school, like the, the head of the school, but they're gonna get in trouble with their own peers who are gonna make it clear to them that what they're doing, the way that they're acting is not acceptable and not okay because it's contrary to the values of the group itself. And, and when it comes to men, that what that means is men need to make it clear to other men that sexist attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors are not cool because they're not just because they're illegal, but because they're not accepted by the, the peer culture. So in other words, men need to be able to challenge other men and interrupt other men when they're acting out in sexist ways. Everything from making derogatory comments about women's bodies to you know, physical and sexual abuse. And then the goal of this approach, the bystander approach, is to get people around the person experiencing the harassment, the abuse, and the violence to make it clear to that person that that they support them, that they are on their side, and they're there to help them and support them in whatever way possible. The beauty of this bystander approach is that everybody in a given peer culture has a really constructive role to play because it's not just isolated to the perpetrator and the victim. And by the way, I think it's important, with, without going into great detail, I just to give you a little bit of background on how this came about, is when I started working in the early 90s in the sports culture in the United States, my thinking, I wanted to work, I wanted to start working in sports culture because I think sport has an incredibly influential role in shaping norms about gender, especially. And it's, it has other roles in society, but it has an incredibly important socializing effect on young people around gender norms. What is, what is masculine? What is feminine? Et cetera. And sport has an incredibly pervasive power it's global it's every socioeconomic class every racial and ethnic group engages in sport so i was thinking how do we use sport in a positive and constructive way to get more men to speak out on this issue and um we got funding this is back in the early 1990s 1992 93 we got funding from the united states department of education to create a model program and the model program was gonna be working with young men on, in university athletic teams, which we have in the States. It's, big, it's a big, you know, important institution in the universities is athletics. And we were gonna be working with um, young men exclusively, initially, on you know, American football, you know, soccer, baseball, hockey, lacrosse, you know, wrestling. We're gonna be working with these young men. The question is, what are we gonna to say to these young men that invites them into the conversation rather than indicts them as potential rapists and abusers. And I say invite rather than indict, which is a, a quote from Esther Soler, who's a famous American activist on gender violence issues. Invite rather than indict, because back in the 1970s and 1980s, most of the people who did what they called prevention work around sexual assault and domestic violence, they focused on women and girls as victims or potential victims, and they focused on men as perpetrators or potential perpetrators. So the spirit of the message to men back in those days was, you better listen up. You better know the law in this state or this country around sexual consent. You need to know that if you're pushing forward sexually with, with, with a partner or with somebody, and you're not sure if they're consenting, that if you keep going, you could be committing sexual assault. Or if you're in a um, relational conflict and you're starting to get worked up, 
and you're starting to escalate your sort of, a, you know, a potential aggression, you need to figure out how to de-escalate because if you go one step further, you could be committing a crime, you know, domestic violence. And the problem with focusing on men and young men in that way is most men don't see themselves as perpetrators and they disidentify with it and they sometimes get angry that you're just implying that they might be a potential perpetrator. And so a lot of men and young men would shut down. And, and, and we, I was trying to figure out, how do you do the opposite? How do you get men to buy in rather than shut down? And this idea of the bystand, focusing on the bystander, which was being pioneered in the late 1980s and early 1990s by a number of researchers in the US around, the, around bullying and preventing bullying, I was like, oh my God, how, why don't we take that idea from the anti-bullying world that what, I had one of my professors in graduate school, one of the, one of the leading you know, figures who was trying to implement uh, bystander work in the bullying prevention world. Why don't we take that idea from the bullying prevention world and bring it into the sexual assault and domestic violence and sexual harassment prevention world? And so what we did is we took that approach and, and the beauty of it is we focused on men as friends, teammates, and classmates, and colleagues, and co-workers of other men, as well as women. And we, 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 tried to, we started thinking about giving them ways and techniques to challenge and interrupt friends of theirs when they saw people around them in their workplace or in their personal lives acting in these ways. And, and we don't tell them what to do. We don't say, this is what you need to do. We, we, we help them think through a range of their options in given situations and their ethical obligations to each other and to themselves as friends and teammates and classmates and colleagues and coworkers. In other words, if I'm in a workplace, for example, and I have a guy who I know who's my friend, he's in my workplace, and I see him making comments about women and women's bodies that I know are inappropriate and unacceptable. I'm not his boss. I'm his friend. What do I do? And if I just put my head down and pretend that I'm not seeing what I'm seeing, am I really living up to my ethical obligation to women who, who might be the target of harassment, to my friend himself, because he could be jeopardizing his job, because what he's doing could get him in trouble and I care about him, to myself, because if I see myself as a person who, when I see injustice, I speak up. If I don't speak up, aren't I compromising my own sense of myself? And don't I want to align my actions with my self-regard uh, or self-understanding? And, and then finally, do, you have, do I have a responsibility to the group, to the workplace, to the team, to the unit? Because we say that we, we treat each other with respect, but I'm seeing one person tr treating other people with disrespect. And doesn't that hurt the whole group and the whole workplace and if I don't speak up aren't I helping to perpetuate harm in the workplace that I care about and morale in the in the group that I care about so in a sense if I speak I'm not just speaking for myself if I tell him that I don't like the way he's behaving I'm not just speaking for myself I'm speaking for the best values of the group and is that what we need to do so the bystander approach as you as you can hear has it has widespread applicability because this could be in a workplace, it could be in a in a in a um, uh, an organization, it could be in a school setting, it can be in the military, it could be on a police force, it could be any number of different situations. And by the way, women are also bystanders; they're also friends, teammates, classmates, colleagues, coworkers. What can girls and women do who are not themselves victims or survivors, who are not themselves perpetrators? but who are embedded in social, family, school, and professional relationships with others, how can they support victims and survivors? How, how can they challenge abusive behavior safely? I'm, I'm not saying do it um, you know, in a superhero way and take risks, but do it safely and smartly. And how can they provide leadership to younger women and men, just like I'm saying men need to provide that, uh, women need it to do it as well.
It's just impressive concept and uh, very inspiring. It also reminds me, like you know, of the concept of uh, uh, my mountaineer climbers uh, who have to look after each other when they go uh, to climb the mountain. They have to look uh, uh, towards uh, uh, after a person near uh, them. So it's just uh, uh, looking after one person can save uh, the whole chain. And probably here is also some connection with this concept. So everyone can just watch uh, around, look around uh, and find some gaps and try to fix them just by saying something, just uh, uh, by making some very, very easy actions. It's not like just uh, changing, uh, making something hero uh, actions, as you've mentioned. That's right, that's right. And uh, no, very well said, uh, Karina. And I, I, would, I would add, that the bystander, again, that's all, all that means is a friend or a teammate or a classmate or a coworker. The bystander who speaks up, right? Who says, like the 15 year old boy who turns to his friend who just told a joke about rape and says, you know, that's not funny. I don't, I don't think jokes about rape are funny, right? And maybe that 15 year old boy's mother is a rape survivor. Maybe, maybe his sister, you know, maybe he knows a girl or a woman who, I mean, Maybe not, but maybe. Anyways, if he tells, if he turns to his friend and says, I don't think that's funny, could you joke about something else? That's actually a leadership act. He might not see himself as a leader and he might not have any credential next to his name that suggests that he's a leader in a formal sense, but the act of saying that's not funny to his friend is the leadership act. Because you know what? He noticed the situation, something was wrong, some harm m might be done. He, he, he tried to think about his responsibility to the various parties involved. Again, this not, might not be conscious, but this is what he's doing. And then he thought, what are my options? What can I do in this situation? He cycled through a series of options and he selected one and then he acted on it. That's what a leader does. So, he, so, so the beauty of this approach is that we're saying that people can be leaders at all levels. You don't have to be you know, in a, in, you know, have a big public stage to be a leader. And it's a positive thing too. It's, it's challenging, in this case, men and young men in a positive way. Like instead of pointing our finger at them and saying, you better stop doing this. It's more like, come on, man, we need more young men. We need more men who have the courage and the strength and the self-confidence to say, this is wrong. And to say, and to, and to stand with women in saying this is wrong and you know and there's, there's we can be better than this i don't think this is anti male at all i think this is actually aspiring to men to be better and to rise to the what what a president abraham lincoln called the better angels of our nature i think this is a positive challenge to men and I, in my long experience in doing this work karina yes men will come into the room defensive sometimes defensive oh uh, what are you going to say about men? Are you going to be bashing men again? You know, and, and, but they don't leave like that. And, I, and I'm telling you, I work extensively in the military, in the sports culture, in tough workplaces, both blue collar, you know, guys who work with their hands and corporate executives. And it's, it's very similar. Some guys will start, often start out defensive, but when they start hearing this and they start thinking about it in a new way, a lot of men can leave thinking, wait a second, maybe, maybe there is something I can do. And you know, yeah, I do have influence. And yeah, maybe I am a father. Maybe I am an uncle or I have young men. I'm a coach. Young men look up to me and young women. And, and you know what? I haven't really talked about this before publicly. I haven't really done anything with my leadership platform, but maybe it's time that I do. And I think that's the goal. And, and I think I, I and my colleagues have experienced this over and over for, for a long time now. So I'm convinced, I'm convinced there's an awful lot of men who are ready to hear some of this stuff. Um, if we, if we present it in the, in a more positive and challenging way. And it's also about the opinion leaders. As you've mentioned, you started implementing this project within uh, popular athletics, uh, uh, some uh, trendsetters uh, in particular communities, because uh, other people are often following the sportsmen, they want to be like them, and if uh, they are for gender equality, probably other people would also like catch up with this trend. But speaking about particular communities, uh, how they can implement this? Uh, should it be uh, 
absolutely like decentralized approach, uh, like word of mouth, it will work for itself, or still some institutional basis is needed uh, uh, from the government, from local and regional authorities, from schools, universities, uh, who should take this leadership about which uh, you've been talking in your wonderful also TEDx speech, uh, which by the way had uh, about uh, 4 million views, uh, so it was just amazing. Thank you. I think it's a great question. I honestly, I think that if a society values justice and fairness and equality and reducing violence, this has to be institutionally um, um, uh, implemented, that it's not just about individuals. Of course, individuals have an incredibly important role to play. But if a society is serious about reducing gender based violence and increasing gender equality, we cannot just put it on the shoulders of individuals. It has to be institutional change. It has to be embedded in the educational system at all levels, in military training, in, in police and in law enforcement training. It has to be in workplaces. People have to be expected, in political leadership, people have to be expected to be, um, to be knowledgeable. Not, they don't have to be experts. Not everybody has to be an expert on domestic violence or sexual assault or something, but they have to know about it and they also have to know about how they can use whatever platform of influence they have to address it. And, and again, when it comes to men, I think, I think a lot of men, when they start learning more about the subject matter, they, and I should say men and women, everybody, they realize, oh my God, domestic and sexual violence are so interwoven with every other problem in our societies. It's not that they're just one problem, that are unique or somehow what we call silo silo in the United States, they're connected. For example, domestic and sexual violence are so connected to alcohol and drug uh, abuse, to, to gang violence, to um, in the United States, to school shootings and mass shootings. There's a direct relationship between domestic violence and, and mass shootings, um, homelessness, um, and issues of child abuse and poverty and, young people acting out, mental health issues and depression. There's so many overlaps between those other social problems and, and what's happening in families, what's happening in, in uh, relationships. And I mean, this whole idea, for example, that there's a private sphere of the family and then there's the public sphere and that they're somehow disconnected. This is naive thinking, okay? That, you know, and feminists have been talking about this for, for at least a half century. There's a direct relationship between the private sphere of the family and the public sphere. And there's all kinds of ways in which they're, you know, interacting with each other. And again, leaders and influencers need to know some of this, again, not to be experts, but they need to know how some of these issues are connected. And then they have to figure out what they can do in their sphere of influence. Um, and if, especially if you're a, 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 a leader in an institutional setting, Right. So you're, for example, you're the head of a high, a, a high school. You have enormous impact on the lives of thousands of young people. And by the way, in the States, I don't know in Ukraine, I don't know in other countries the exact data, but in the States, something like one in five teenage gir girls have been in a physically or sexually abusive relationship by the age of 18. I mean, Something like half of all rape survivors are raped by the age of 18, which that, what that means is if you're, a, if you're a head of a high school, a lot of the kids in your high school have already experienced harassment, abuse, and sexual abuse, and violence, both at home and in their peer culture and in their relationships. And by the way, that's boys as well, not just girls. Many boys have experienced harassment, abuse, and violence. And what are you as a, as a head of the school, the principal of the school, for example, what are you doing about this? Are you providing education? Are you providing training to your teachers, to the, to the coaching staffs, to the, to, the, to the adults who work with the young people? Do they have training on this? What are you doing as a leader, if you're a man, what are you doing as a leader to make it clear to the young men in that school that men who are strong, who are self-confident, speak out on these issues? They stand with women. They promote gender justice, gender equality. Are, are you doing this? Are you using your public platform in the school or in the community? And if you're not, in a sense, aren't you being a passive bystander? Aren't you yourself 
by not addressing this stuff up front, aren't you helping to perpetuate the problem? And can't we, can't we do better than that in the 21st century? Don't we know more than we did back 50 years ago? Yes, we do. We know more. So why aren't we implementing it in our educational practice? These are the kind of challenges we have to be um, offering to people, especially men, but not exclusively, who have institutional and you know, cultural and political leadership and influence. Uh, Dr. Katz, you're also the author of the book, uh, The Macho Paradox, Why Some Men Hurt Women and How All Men Can Help. Uh, aggressive behaviors have different roots, uh, not the least uh, uh, some masculinity patterns that society uh, expects to see in the men, and some men following these standards try to look uh, very strong and try to approve their strongness in very aggressive and strong way. Uh, you in somehow um, violence and discrimination against women and also it can stem from a uh, personal uh, experience in terms of uh, witnessing family violence and then following and using these patterns uh, into uh, growing uh, up our life. Uh, but uh, what is your opinion how we can uh, tackle the roots of this problem from psychological viewpoint and who shall uh, take the responsibility of helping the aggressors uh, because we often talk uh, about helping victims but how to make uh, aggressors also um, help this with this transformation which is very important sure absolutely um, well I mean a big part of my work is trying to prevent the violence from happening in the first place right and because that's what that's what we have to do ultimately because once a man has already committed uh, acts of violence and abuse. There are other issues. There, it's there's sometimes it's criminal, you know, criminal behavior, and there's there's accountability, and um, you've already created harm in your vic in the victims. I mean, so one question is how do we prevent it from happening in the first place? And it's it's I'm not saying there's a simple solution to this. Just like there's not a simple solution once men have aggressed or once they have used abuse, there's no simple solution. I mean, I do think that people have to be held accountable for their behavior. I think we, we have to prioritize the, 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 the safety of victims and survivors. That has to be the priority. Um, but then the question is, is there such a thing as redemption for men who have committed abuse? Are they just, do we just, you know, forget about them and, and think that they're hopeless causes? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, again, I, I do think some, People need to be punished, and people have to face the consequences, both legal and 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 personal consequences of their behavior. But I do think that there is redemption. In other words, men can learn new skills. They can learn how to deal with, for example, their impulse to need to be in control all the time. I mean, for example, one of the things that underlies, we've known this for, for the last several decades because of work with men who are abusive, right? In, 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 in court mandated programs, for example, for men you know, who, are, you know, who perpetrate domestic violence, we know that often there's an underlying belief system that the man should be in control and that his use of force or the threat of force is often a means to either gain or maintain control in, in his relationship, especially with women, right? Now, this is not hardwired into the male brain. This is something that was that was learned, okay? In other words, that, that a man needs to be in control. And if something is learned, it can be unlearned. And one of the things that I, that I, that I, I how I would even reframe the concept of learned behavior is that everything that is learned is also taught. And if you call it learned behavior, it's kind of passive, like they're just learning it. But if you say it's taught behavior, then it, it shifts the onus of responsibility onto those of us who are teaching boys and young men about what it means to be a man. So if we really want to change our societies, we have to look at all the ways that we're teaching boys and young men that being a man means being in control of women, being sexually dominant over women, being sexually entitled to women's bodies. How are we teaching boys and men this through, whether it's through personal, like, you know, in families, but also in the media and in, in the pornography, in the sports culture, in in peer cultures, you know, how do we how do we send the message to boys and men that there's a way to be a man, to be a strong man that does not involve 
abusing others, that does not involve dominating women. And so I think, I think that's a hugely important part of the work that has to be done. And by the way, this whole idea of strength is, is, is key to this. Because some people will, will say, well, what are you saying? We're going to make men soft? We want to make men wimpy? No, I'm not saying that. We want men to be strong. You know, I'm, I think I'm strong. And I think, you know, I have a son and, I, and, and, and my wife and I, we want him to be strong. The, the, definite, the, the, the question is not whether men should be strong or weak. The question is, how do we define strength? And so when I see a man enacting violence on another man or woman, when I see a man abusing his girlfriend or his wife. I don't see a strong man. I don't see a man who's proving to me or others that he's in control, that he's powerful, that his, you know, he's going to get his needs met first. I see a man who's got issues, who's got psychological problems, who's got vulnerability, who might have a trauma history. I don't see a man who's, who's at all a strong man. I don't, just because you have big fists and because you can intimidate people with your ability to use violence. That to me is a very, very, very narrow definition of strength. And for example, courage, right? Let's, how do we define courage? Physical courage is a form of courage. You know, you're, you're, you're people who join you know, the military or who are police who take risks with their life. I appreciate, this is physical courage and I appreciate people who take risks to protect others, okay? But there's also other kinds of courage. There's moral courage. There's social courage. It, like social courage means you're a young guy and you see you're a 23 year old guy and you're, you know, in a peer culture where a couple of men are making really derogatory comments about women. And you know, as an intelligent person, that this is a problem because we have enormous levels of sexual violence and domestic violence in, in the Ukraine and in, in Russia and in the United States and Europe and Africa and Asia, everywhere. And you know that these kinds of comments, these kinds of, you know, dismissive, misogynist comments are part of the problem. If you say something and make it clear that you're not cool with that, that's an act of courage. It's an act of social courage. It's a way of saying, you know what, you might look at me and say, what are you talking about? Or what are you soft? But, I, you know, but you're going to say it anyways, because you know that you're confident enough and self-confident enough to do it and say it because it's the right thing to do. And by the way, this is, this is what, what, from the beginning of my work, uh, Karina, because I, as a young guy, because I was a really good athlete when I was a young man, and I, I was a, Amer American football was my sport. And I'm like, so many men who have physical strength and physical, you know, sort of aggression, that's all they have. Like, they, they, some of them are just, they, they're emotionally, some of these guys are emotionally illiterate. They're emotionally children. But they, because they're physically strong, somehow they, they have this idea that, that that's what it means to be a strong man. And again, are we kidding ourselves? In the 21st century, don't we have a more expansive understanding of what it means to be a full person and, and, and what it means to be a strong, in this case, a strong man beyond physical ability? And I think, I think obvious. And so I think we need, to, we need to talk about this. And so we need to talk to men about other ways that they can be successful and strong that don't involve hurting other people. Absolutely. So the true strength uh, is about helping others and supporting them instead of uh, trying to uh, reflect the weakness uh, of being vulnerable through these uh, absolutely inhuman and uh, inappropriate patterns. Uh, from your practice uh, and uh, also from psychological theory, uh, whether say second chances matter. As some psychologists say uh, that uh, if once violence happened, it will be repeated. It is likely to be repeated in the future. Sure. I mean, again, I think the first priority is going to be safety, it, it, the safety of the victims or the potential victims and survivors of abuse. So if, if accountability for the perpetrator means that that person needs to be removed, that person needs to be confined or, you know, arrested or, or held accountable in some way or, or in some, you know, in, in other cases, ha suffer penalties socially, not just, not just legally, but be, you know, make, if people around that person need to make it clear that that person's behavior is unacceptable and that they can't remain in good standing in their, in their peer culture, in their community, if they continue to behave in this way, these are all important 
pieces of the puzzle. I don't think we, we can say there's one person or one group that's responsible for holding offenders accountable. Um, and it's certainly not the victims. I don't, I don't think the victims and the survivors of the abuse should be held accountable for, I mean, excuse me, should be made to feel like their, it's their responsibility to hold the perpetrator accountable. They, they have to take care of themselves. Uh, I think those of us around them, whether it's in a family, in a community, or in, polit in the political leadership, or the community leadership, or the religious leadership, oh, to make it clear. What's that? Standards. Yes, that's right. We all need to make it clear that that behavior is not okay. And, and, and always, like I said, making sure that the safety of everybody, the children involved, the, you know, the, the victims and survivors comes first in, in our mind. But over, overall, by the way, can I say, there's a ton of men who are victims of violence and abuse. And, and, and it, it, there's a ton of men who are walking wounded because they are victims of abuse. There's a ton of men who develop alcohol and drug problems because they're medicating against the effects of abuse that they have experienced. And think about, for example, look at all the boys who are traumatized when they're children by their father's abuse towards their mother. You know how many, you know how many young boys in our societies suffer that kind of trauma? Girls do too, of course, but boys do too. And, 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 and a lot of boys don't have the skills because we don't teach them the skills of how to deal with sadness, grief, loss, anger in ways that are constructive rather than repeating the same patterns, you know, violence, abuse, take it out on others, you know, I've, something happened to me, so I'm going to do something bad to somebody else. Or, or like I said, the self-medicating, you know, drink, drink themselves to, to, to medicate themselves against their feelings of vulnerability and loss. I mean, we all have responsibility to help boys be healthier because girls will benefit and women will benefit, but also boys will benefit and men will benefit. There's an awful lot of sad men out there. There's an awful lot of men who live diminished lives because of violence done to them, done to women close to them. And it doesn't have to be this way. Uh, I remember watching the film uh, The Soldier Jane and uh, some uh, pieces uh, of violence uh, uh, were shot there, were included in this film. Uh, earlier, I didn't uh, understand the whole scale of this problem of violence in the military. But then after researching, after growing up, after watching this film, I understood that it was not just uh, um, somehow um, a bit of uh, uh, imagination, but it was a reality that uh, existed uh, and unfortunately still exists. Uh, you are actively working with the United States Navy. Uh, how the perception of women in the Army has been changed over the recent years, uh, whether there is uh, uh, some positive dynamics uh, and uh, uh, what are the practical solutions? Sure. <laughs> sure. I'll, I'll have to be brief on this one because there's a, there's, a there's a lot to this and, and I'll try to be concise. But um, I think the military has made a lot of progress over the last um, 20 or so years, uh, but there's still a long way to go. I mean, there's still an awful lot of sexual violence and harassment in the military. Most of it's perpetrated by men against women and men against other men. Um, there's, there's been increasing attention to this subject because there's been pressure on the military from the United States Congress, you know, the, the political establishment, as well as media coverage. But there's also a lot of people in the military who are concerned about this. And they know that um, it hurts morale, it hurts mission readiness. There's all kinds of reasons why domestic and sexual violence in the military harms the military itself, in addition to contributing to a much bigger problem. Um, I think one of, the, one of the solutions, it's not the only one, is we need more women in positions of leadership. I mean, we need to, to, we need to promote more women, more women in the military, more women ascending to rank, to higher ranks so they have more influence. Because we know from, again, both common sense and from practical experience for the past num many decades, the more women that make it into positions of leadership and decision making within institutions, the more that issues that directly affect women get attention, get priority, get discussed, 
and get implemented in terms of policy. So the more women, for example, in the military who are in position, whether it's in the Army, the Navy, the Marine Corps, the Air Force, these are the, you know, the Coast Guard, these are the major branches of the US military. The more women get into those positions of leadership, the more we're gonna see um, um, attention to this subject. And we're gonna see more men who are accustomed to thinking about women as their equals and even their superior officers. In other words, they're, they're, they're gonna look up to women in, in a way that that begins to condition them to think that what they really respect is leadership and qualities of, of strength and, and compassion and, and organizational sophistication. And in the, in the case of military, being, being a, a, an effective military leader, not as much a man or a woman, but a person who does the job really well. And to the extent that we can increase women's, um, the normalization of women doing all kinds of different jobs at all kinds of levels of leadership, the men will become more and more accustomed to thinking about women as their partners and their equals, um, rather than the old way of thinking, which is, this is a man's job, this is men's work, and these women don't really belong. Because the men who still believe that in the 21st century, and, and there, there are decreasing numbers of men who believe that, but there's still a lot of men who do believe that around the world in militaries. This is men's work. Women can support us, but this is essentially about men and men's leadership. To the extent that we can shift our under, men's understanding of gender equality and inclusivity, we're going to reduce violence because men, men are not going to feel entitled to women's bodies. They're not going to feel entitled to dominate women, both interpersonally and in the workplace. And, and then as a result, we'll be healthier. And, and by the way, we'll be more effective. Our, our, our institutions will work better. Our societies will work better. Because a lot of this behavior, this, this dominating behavior, this abusive behavior, is harming not just individual victims and survivors, it's harming the entire institution and the entire society. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. So it's also about reducing barriers uh, for women to participate. Uh, I know some stories of women who were unable to enter, for instance, special armed forces uh, because uh, uh, they have uh, uh, to keep up to uh, the minimum wage criteria, uh, which was much more than the woman was, about 90 kilos, uh, in order to be liable just for testing. Uh, Though the results, uh, uh, overall exercising, uh, she could win, but uh, without this weight uh, criteria, she couldn't uh, even participate, uh, even be provided with a chance to enter uh, some military groups. Uh, so it's very important uh, um, to think also in terms of uh, our idea, uh, our ideal, our mission as uh, both uh, women and men, uh, how to fulfill the dream to belong to the army. That's right, and it, 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 absolutely well said. But and just one added point. The, the nature of military engagement and conflict has changed so dramatically over the decade that it's, in, it's decreasingly important. Physical size and strength have become less and less important to the fulfillment of the military mission because it's become more intellectual. It's become more technological. And, and in the intellectual and technological realm, there's very little difference between men and women. So you can't point to physical size and strength differentials as a way to exclude women when the 21st century um, military engagement is much more, has much more moved into the virtual, the technological, and the realms where physical size and strength are much less important. Absolutely. So it's not about the ancient tribes uh, when a person had to wait uh, uh, and to be very, very physically strong, but it's about mental strength uh, also and new kinds of tools like empathy when women communicate with their subordinates, uh, how to uh, notice these uh, psychological changes uh, and to try to uh, implement and support uh, those guys uh, who will be then fighting and uh, before war also this is very very important. Uh, how culture can help here? Uh, I know that uh, you are the uh, author uh, of wonderful fi uh, films, you're a filmmaker. Uh, what are your films are about uh, and how these films uh, can help uh, to change our mentality and to help uh, uh, both men and women equally participate? Sure, sure. Well, my, my, my films, my first film was called Tough Guys. 
and the word guys is spelled G-U-I-S-E. So it's sort of like disguise, you know, tough disguise or tough guys. And um, in English, um, the subtitle is Violence, Manhood, and American Culture. And so what we're looking at in my, in many of my films looking, are looking at ways that the media narratives, the stories we tell, the in the entertainment media, in whether it's Hollywood films or television shows or music or um, video games, you know, ad advertising, the, what, the stories that we tell about manhood and about womanhood and about gender more generally beyond men and women, how those stories and how those narratives help to shape belief systems about what is, what is normal, what is acceptable, what does it mean to be a man or a woman? And so much of my work has looked at media narratives about manhood and how influential media is in shaping certain norms and expectations around what it means to be powerful as a man, powerful, strong, in control. Um, and what is it, you know, and, and, and because I think we live in a media soaked world right media is incredibly influential and so if we're going to if we're going to change the the norms the ideas about manhood and womanhood that need to be changed and and made more you know brought up to date with the 21st century we have to critically examine media and and you know um so part of my work for for you know 25 years now has been to look critically at media and help students and young people but not just young people older people too develop the tools to understand how media narratives are shaping both individual beliefs but also you know producing and reproducing norms in society and then when you have that greater sensibility of the role that media is playing the negative stuff has less of a of an effect because you can see through it you can understand it in a way and you can insulate yourself in a certain sense from some of the negative influence that some of that media has. And, and by the way, there's plenty of good stuff in media too. I'm not saying it's all bad. I mean, obviously there's lots of narratives and stories and beautiful art that is, that is in uplifting and that is ennobling to humans. But there's other stuff that just reproduces some of the same old cliches and stereotypes. And so helping students and others sort of sift through all of this and have a more sophisticated understanding of what's going on. And by the way, one of, is important. And by the way, one of the, one of the pieces to that is we have to have more women making media, women making films, women writing stories and telling stories across every ethnicity and racial group, across every, you know, um, geographic region and country. Um, yeah, we need men to tell stories, but we need more women. We need more people of color. We need more stories, and we need to hear different perspectives. And, I, and, I, and, I, and I, as a man, I'm not threatened by that. In fact, I welcome that. I, I think it's better for everybody. And I want to hear stories that women tell. I want to see and watch movies that women have written the script, women have directed, because I want to see their perspective, because it's going to help me be smarter and, and more understanding and more knowledgeable both personally and professionally. So I think, I think men should welcome this, including white men, perspectives of women, people of color and others making media. And that's, that's an incredibly important shift. And it's happening. It's, it, you could say it's slow in one sense, but it's, it is really happening. If you look at the number of women who are making movies, for example, in the United States, it's way more than 20 years ago and way, way more than when I was a kid, right? And, and if you look at the number of people of color who have made movies, for example, in Hollywood, you could say it's still not anywhere near enough, but it's way more than there was when I was a kid. So, so, so young people today have the experience of being able to watch movies um, and, um, and television shows and, and playing video games that have more complex and racially and ethnically and gender and sexually diverse you know, stories and people and groups than, than, than was around 30 or 40 years ago. And I think that's all good because it's all part of the same project, which is have, making us be better as human beings and making our societies more rich and more um, diverse and therefore more, more real. And, 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 and it, it, all of this has the effect, in my opinion, of reducing violence. Because to the extent that we can increase equality both of representation, but also in, in more generally, 
to the extent that we can increase equality and justice, we're going to decrease violence. Because, you know, so much violence in the world, Karina, is enacted to maintain inequality. Whether it's interpersonal violence, where a, a man is using violence to enforce his authority over his you know, wife in a domestic violence context, or as at the level of the state or governments, so much of vi violence is used to enforce inequality. And so to the extent that we can increase equality, we're going to decrease the need for violence to enforce inequality. Absolutely. It couldn't, it couldn't be uh, have said better. Thank you so much for such a wonderful and amazing conversation. Uh, you mentioned uh, the importance of sharing stories. Uh, our motto of our uh, project and interviews uh, is uh, that uh, we learn from one another through sharing stories and we discover the world through the stories. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your story today here and uh, providing such very meaningful meaningful insights uh, that I hope will be heard and followed as we are all bystanders. Uh, we all have responsibility for what is happening, uh, not only in our neighborhood, in our community, but in the world. But we should uh, all, um, of course, start uh, with small steps uh, with our family and then with the community and then uh, far, uh, more far and far. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, amazing conversation. Uh, the last but not the least, uh, what would be your message to people watching us uh, uh, on uh, both men, women, boys and girls, uh, uh, how to make this world more equal and how to fully eradicate this uh, um, enormous mistake uh, in the consciousness of mankind uh, that is called uh, gender-based violence and violence of any form? Well, Sure. Um, well, first, thank you very much for doing this and for inviting me to be part of it. I think it's great what you're doing and, and congratulations um, on your on your leadership and activism. Um, I'll just be I'll just be brief because I've said a lot of this already. I'll just say um, women have been doing incredible work to advance gender equality um, and reduce gender based violence all over the world. In, again, in a multiracial, multi-ethnic sense, in every country, women's leadership has been at the forefront. It's, it's helped tremendously, not just women and girls, although it has helped women and girls. It's also helped men and boys. And I think the, there's a growing movement of men in, this, in the world who, that I'm a part of who are learning from women and women's leadership and figuring out ways that we can apply some of these great ideas about gender justice and equality and nonviolence to men's lives both individually and collectively. And I think, I guess, as I've said, there's an awful lot of suffering among men. There's an awful lot of suffering that men cause, both to women and to other men, but also a lot of men suffer as well, emotionally and, and relationally and mental health and physically. There's an awful lot of problems that men suffer. Look at, look at men in your part of the world. How many men die young, who die with heart disease, who die with alcohol, I mean, Right? I mean, there's an awful lot of problems that a lot of men have. And I think women and women's leadership have pointed us, us in a direction of how to get healthier as men. So I think we need to honor women's leadership, but I, those of us who are men need to figure out how more of us can join those women and can support those women and support each other. And I think individual initiative is important, but it's really important to get involved in groups and in organizations and in movements because really the way that human civilization shifts is not just through individual action, it's through collective action. And to the extent that we can get more men involved in supporting organizational changes and, and joining women and other men in this effort, we can, you know, we can change, we can change the world. We can, I mean, there's no question about it. And I think for those of us who are older, like myself, I think we have an added responsibility to the next generation, to younger people like yourself, um, to, to provide whatever resources we can, whatever insights we can from our life you know, journey, so that your generation can do better than our generation. And I would say, especially to men who are you know, you know, middle-aged and older men, we really have to step up our game. We really have to do better. We're not doing as well as we can, not even close. And, and I think that, you know, we have a lot of work to do. But again, we've had the, um, the great benefit of, of living in a time where an incredible number of incredible women 
who have shown us a better path. And I think we need to, we need to have the strength and the self-confidence to, uh, to take their lead and to provide our own leadership. So that's what I think. Thank you so much. It was a deep honor and pleasure to learn from you. Thank you for sharing your vision, thoughts, and ideas. Uh, it is of the highest value. Thank you very much, Karina. Take care and good luck to you and all the best.